if we take the, the run of the briefs that you generally see, what one prescription could they follow to, in general, to be improved? What to be improved? Oh, well, uh, for the most part, <laughs> they're doing pretty well right, right now. Uh, uh, the most important thing is to be uh, accurate and intellectually honest in your arguments and, and state them clearly, but most of the briefs really are of, are of high quality ones in the cases that we hear on the merits. Why is it important to identify the weak points in your own argument and, and grapple with those weaknesses? I'm sorry, I didn't... Why is it important to grapple with the weaknesses in your own argument? Well, you want to get the right answer. And you, and you also want to, you know, you don't want to give invalid reasons for a conclusion. It's, that's quite important. And there are times when you, when you work on an opinion, you, you come out differently than when you started it. You, you, you recognize weaknesses that you didn't see before. How often does it happen that you'll start on an opinion and realize this just won't write? Not very often, but once in a while it does happen. And probably not once every couple of years at the, at the most. Yeah. Do you think that there is a, an appreciable difference in what brief writers need to be doing at the Supreme Court as opposed to the circuit level? Uh, no, I think it's essentially the same same task. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, no, it's, it's basically the same job. What is the best and most important thing to do in a reply brief? Well, address arguments that uh, you may not have covered in your original brief and uh, uh, respond to arguments that, uh, uh, you, you know, that you haven't met in the, in the first time around. When you, when you begin considering a case, uh, can you describe your own reading? Do you read a bench memo and then the, the lower court's opinion? Is it a predictable thing that you go through? Most, most often I start by reading the lower court opinion. And then, uh, then I take the briefs, I read the blue brief, the red brief, and the yellow brief. And it's amazing how often I'd be totally convinced when I read the blue brief and I read the red brief, I think, golly, I sure had that one wrong. And I read the yellow brief and I go back to where I was. It's a, and then they, often you're not sure until after argument. These, we get a lot of cases in which reasonable people can differ, and there are good arguments on both sides. And uh, I, I uh, I find the briefs are very, very helpful. Of course, then I, I look at some of the cases that are cited. It's interesting, though, in, in our cases, most often there's only one or two or three of our prior precedents that really affect your decision. It usually, it usually turns pretty much on one or two cases. And in, in, in such a case, of course, I go back and reread the case unless I remember it. And sometimes I don't remember it even though I wrote it. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it happens that way. And then, of course, I always talk to my law clerks. I don't have them write bench memos, but I always review the cases and my thinking about the case, both before argument and after argument. I, I ask them to come in and we sit down and talk about what happened at the argument. And then I'll talk to them again at, uh, before and after conference. I have a lot of conversation uh, with my clerks to get their, their uh, reaction to the case. Uh, so, so, but I don't have them write, I, can, I like to get, hear what the lawyers have to say in the first, uh, as my first uh, introduction of the case. When I was watching arguments in, in the court recently, I remember thinking, boy, that is a good argument on this side, that's a good argument on the other side. I, if I were having to decide, I, I could go either way and be quite happy with it. Do you often leave the bench after oral argument with that feeling? Sometimes, most of the time, I have, uh, I'm fairly confident in which way, which way I'll vote. But you're right, there are a lot of cases in which there, you recognize there are reasonable arguments on both sides, and uh, 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 particularly statutory cases. Um, but, uh, uh, but most of the time, by the time the argument's over, I have a, I'm fairly well persuaded one way or the other, but 
But as I said, I've changed my mind not only after argument, but after conference and after starting to write an opinion. So it's, it's uh, it has a lot of uh, flexibility and, and variation from case to case. There seem to be two views on how a judge should write an opinion that is when the case is very close. One view is that you should write it up as if the opinion that you ultimately come out with, the decision, was inevitable and it's almost a slam dunk that way. The other view is more in the line of, of Learned Hand and Henry Friendly. The Henry Friendly is the best example. There's this argument and that argument. So, And Dick Posner does that too. He, he, he does that in a number of his opinions. I think that's, that's a fine way to write opinions. It almost uh, oversimplifies the decision making just to write it up as if it were all a slam dunk. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them you can write it. When you get through with it, there's a choice and you explain uh, which way you think it should be said and, you, and it can be done rather concisely, but uh, it's appropriate to spell it out, I think. What are your most important tips on oral argument? Well, uh, be well prepared, of course. Be intellectually honest. Don't try and, and conceal problems that the, the judges are going to find anyway. And uh, uh, do the best you can to, to uh, explain why your side should win. How often do you witness intellectual dishonesty? Very rarely, but every now and then you do. A lawyer will uh, either make a statement which arguably is, is designed to create an incorrect impression of the record or of the law. It happens rarely, I'm glad to say, because we do have uh, professionals arguing before us. But, but on occasion, you're a little unhappy with what the lawyer does. Does it ever happen that an intellectually dishonest lawyer will win? Well, if he's right, he may win despite himself. I can remember a case when I was a law clerk that the, um, I think it was argued by a, a, an attorney general of one of the states, it was a tax case in which uh, I remember all the law clerks in advance of the argument thought there's no way in the world that this guy could win. And particularly when he made his argument that there's nothing to it, and it was so bad that the clerks decided they better try and research the problem and figure out what arguments might be made on that side of the case. <laughs> and they convinced that they come up, came up with arguments he totally uh, omitted and he won the case. But that doesn't happen very often. What is the most overlooked little point on, on oral argument, a nicety that, that more advocates ought to pick up? Well, I haven't, I haven't really thought about that. Of course, we're always glad if they can, they can bring a little bit of levity into a serious problem. I don't want to, to uh, I, I, don't, I really don't know what the answer to that question is. Um, how much does grammar matter to you? Well, it, do, it does matter. It, it really does. And it's, it's perhaps unfair, but if someone uses improper grammar, you begin to think, well, maybe Maybe the person isn't as careful about his work or his or her work as he or she should be if he if doesn't speak carefully. And, I, and grammar is, is really quite important. Uh, and you don't, we don't uh, encounter uh, grammatical errors too often. How, how often do you see typographical errors? How do ty ty typographical ty errors. I think I could, I, there's almost never a brief that I don't find a typographical error in. It's amazing, even though they're proofread over and over again, there are errors that are very common. Not, I mean, especially with the, with the word processor now, you can, if the word it will not, you know, get the spell check, but even though it should have been if or in or is. And there are a, lot of, there are a fair number of errors that just creep in and people miss. It's surprising. Does it bother you at all? No, I, I always correct them when I read the briefs. <laughs> are the, those little briefs that you, with your marks on them, are they kept anywhere? Perhaps I'm probably in the wastebasket. I, don't <laughs> know. I certainly don't file them away. Do you enjoy reading briefs? Well, yes, uh, I do, although sometimes I have to confess that uh, 
uh, they seem somewhat longer than necessary on occasion, but, uh, but I, I do, yes. Do you continue to learn new things about writing? Yes, yeah, I do. I learn from, from, uh, uh, learn from my clerks, to tell you the truth. I will write something, they'll sometimes rewrite a, a paragraph, and I think, gee, that sounds a lot better. And I, I, I learn a great, it's a constant learning process, yes. Do lawyers have a professional responsibility to cultivate their writing skills? I would think so, yes. They, 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 uh, they do, and I think they probably perform that responsibility quite well, at least those that appear before us. Yeah. Well, I think, I know you've got a, an appointment to get to. I want to thank you very much uh, well, I've for enjoyed your time it. today. Thank you. Thank you.